for being here. Precious creator, we give you thanks and praise for being in our midst, for being with each and every one of us, for blessing us on the Sabbath day. We come before you to have you fill us with your Holy Spirit. We ask that you give blessings and um, strength to the person who's going to give the, the um, presentation. We ask that we will be all be mindful and understand. We thank you again, Father, for loving us in spite of ourselves, for being with us each and every day, for knowing our trials, our hardships, our strengths. We know that you are among us all the time. And we ask for forgiveness for the times where we have disappointed you. But we know that you know that we are trying and that we want to do our best. And we can't do our best, Father, without you by our side, holding our hands, giving us hugs, just helping us. We feel your presence. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, okay. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Okay, good. Okay, so let's see, where is the share? I, why, why am I not, okay. The screen that has the blue all around it, can I touch on other websites and stuff when I'm, when I'm in that particular screen? It's the one on the top, on the top left, when I'm having to share. It says screen, doesn't it say screen? Yeah. It says screen, yeah. Yeah, that one, that one lets you move around. Okay, good, perfect. If you're in full screen with a slideshow, I don't know how yours works. I know I can't, I won't see all the other things, so. Okay, do you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, um, this was done in March, 2020 in Portugal. Um, and it kind of, there's a lot of review on it from the previous past couple of uh, presentations. And so if you saw uh, Logina's presentation on Wednesday, there's gonna be quite a bit of, of that review. That was a really good review, by the way, that if you haven't seen that, go ahead and see that because it's really good. And so this one's gonna, she's gonna do quite a bit of that review. And, um, Okay, here we go. Supreme Court cases. I want us to remember what we've done so far. The studies may seem disjointed, but there are some key points that I want us to remember. We started by doing a reform line and we spoke about each dispensation having one testing message. It may seem like it's disconnected messages, but in fact, it's just one message. In fact, it's just one message. Hold on. The very first subject that was given to God's people was line upon line. And this is what we call reform lines. Also too, I have about 34 slides. So this is probably gonna be maybe 45 minutes to an hour. So, we're gonna have time for other things or we'll also have time for discussion for anybody to make comments. So that'd be good. Okay, question. Is every line a reform line? No. No. We have our reform line and then we have other histories or other lines that get overlaid with our own. There are four key reform lines. I'm not saying that these are the only reform lines because there are others, but these are the ones, the key ones. These key lines are the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega of ancient Israel. Then 
the alpha and omega of the end of modern Israel. So we have the beginning and the end of modern Israel, and we know that this is the captivity of Egypt. Here, they are to come out of Egypt, and here they are in captivity to Rome. In our history, we have the Millerites coming out of the 1260. Then we have the 144,000 coming out of the 126. So we have the beginning and the end of ancient Israel and the beginning and end of modern Israel. The Alpha and Omega and the Alpha and Omega. These are our key reform lines. What I have suggested is if this is the line of the priests that began in 1989 with the reform lines, then we are here. I have suggested that these reform lines become key in understanding the closing history. We understand the principle that God tells the end by the beginning and 2014 becomes our Sunday law. We then go through the history of the latter reign to 2019, which is our close of probation or the shut door. Through these final months, just before our close of probation, we, begin, we began to refine all three of our reform lines. However, one line in particular was refined. And at this point in, in our history, the reform line that we need more than any other is the end of ancient Israel. It will directly tell us about the end of modern Israel. It's an Omega history and a history of success, just like ours. This is where we've been headed from the very beginning, to study the line of Christ, because it's the line of Christ as a history of success and the end of Israel that will tell us most clearly where we stand. When, we when we're discussing the themes that we are focusing on, it becomes the history of the end of ancient Israel that God unpacks for us. When we begin to understand another theme, for example, the Sunday law, what reform line do we need to understand? Does anybody know that? When we begin to understand the reform lines, like the Sunday law, what reform line do we need to understand? the Millerites. We need to look at 1850 and 1888. So we know that we still have work to do in understanding both histories. God began to unpack these three reform lines, but most of the information was for this history, the history of Christ. I don't mean to diminish the others. The next reform line that God will open up in a com comprehensive way will be the Millerites, but we're not there yet. The one he's drawing our attention to now is the end of ancient Israel. This is the one that we have been building up to. This is what we've been meaning to discuss at this school, but I first wanted to remind us of what has been happening in our history. In our plowing, it's telling us we're in this new reform line. In our early reign, it's telling us that we are now in time and approaching the Sunday law. As we enter our latter rain history, we are requ required to understand the test of the Sunday law. We also studied these two superpowers or two kingdoms of Bible prophecy, one on the North and one on the South. And we understood the test that we were in, which is nationalism, sexism, Eden to Eden, new earth to new earth, it's all about equality. We showed how we take the subject of World War III and how that becomes a study of equality. Then we wanted to show that it isn't just a subject here, but in fact, this subject of equality was how our reform line began. We would have no reform line because church and state 
would not come together in America if there hadn't been three primary movements before the time of the end. So we discussed these three movements. We began with the civil rights movement. This is a movement that relates to nationalism and racism. We talked about nationalism and racism. They are just different shades of the same color. In essence, they are the same thing, but with a slightly different perspective. Donald Trump is a nationalist. He's proud of his nation and he wants his nation to be the best nation in the world. He believes that the reason his nation is so special is because it's, it's this white Christian nation. He's afraid he's going to lose this nation that he's so proud of if it's contaminated by all these inferior people. When we talk about nationalism and racism, we might be highlighting a different aspect, but it's just like a different shade of the same color. Fundamentally, it's the same thing because you don't have nationalism without racism and you don't have racism without nationalism. That was a meme, by the way. Did you guys notice that? Isn't that a meme right here? That's what they call a meme. Hitler was a nationalist. Therefore, he had, a, he had to protect his special nation from contamination by inferior Jews and gypsies, by homosexuals or people with disabilities. He wanted to keep his nation special and clean. In other words, Racism and nationalism are the same thing, but from a slightly different perspective. This mindset happens all during the civil rights movement. Does anybody have any questions yet? Okay. There's a couple of important court cases during the civil rights movement that were already re we've already researched previously. Does anyone remember the first court case? that should come to mind. It's a famous court case. It was a national headlines during the civil rights movement. Does anybody remember? Brown versus Board of Education. Yes. That was the first court case, Brown versus Board of Education. When was this case decided by the Supreme Court? Do you, everybody, anybody remember the year? Uh, was it? 54, 1954? Yes, 1954. In 1954, the Supreme Court decided that it was unconstitutional to segregate public schools. This began the slow but steady end of segregation in America. We went a little into this history and we spoke about how the people responded. When the private schools started putting pressure on public schools to desegregate, it took a long time for them to adapt to it. In one example, the state of Mississippi put pressure on schools to desegregate. In 1968, there were 23,000 students in private schools. By 1970, that number increased 23,000 times three which was 63,000. In one country where white students in public schools numbered in county, I'm sorry, in one county where white students in public schools numbered 770, the next year it went down to 28. And the following year, it went down to zero. Every one of those white children were put into private schools. Segregation became worse after these court cases than it was before the court cases. There's a couple of other court cases that are important. One in particular that happened in 1971. This court case was done by another African-American family and their issue was the private schools. First, they take down the public schools 
and now they turn to the private schools. There are two court cases close together. First, it was Green versus Kennedy. And this is all about tax exempt status of private schools. In 1970, there was this court case and it wasn't a strong decision, but it was enough for President Nixon to order the IRS to enact a new policy that would make segregated schools pay taxes. In 1971, it was Green versus Connolly, and they upheld this. They said that racially discriminative private schools cannot be entitled to tax exemption because they stopped allowing them to define themselves as charities or as charitable educational institutions. It's this Green versus Connolly's attack on these private Christian schools that gained the attention of the religious right because they were the ones building private schools to take in the white students. We named two of the largest schools that two of the leading evangelicals started. Does anybody remember what schools they are? Liberty University and uh, Bob Jones. Yes, Liberty University and Bob Jones, which Liberty University used to be called Lynchburg Academy. So it's this Green versus Connolly ruling that started to awaken these evangelical leaders for the need to become political. That was one movement. If you are a nationalist, you wanna keep your nation and your race at the top or supreme. So what, what is the great threat? What are you afraid of? Anybody? What, what were these schools afraid of? Um, disappearing of the whites? Yes. There was, there was something else that they were afraid of. Something to do with their taxes. Oh, the IRS was going to come after them? There you go. They were afraid of the IRS. Fear is over taxes. We put the thought here at this mentality of these conservative Protestant leaders is the exact same mindset that we found in this movement at its beginning. It's this conspiracy, conspiracy theory of this overreaching IRS. It is the IRS that woke up the Protestants. It's the IRS that Reagan attacked to win the Protestants. He said to an audience of thousands of Protestants that the IRS was chasing these segregated private schools, that it was some kind of evil unconstitutional agenda. He sympathized with these private schools. What they are afraid of is the IRS coming for their money. And that is also what Elder Jeff was afraid of. It's how he believed that FFA would end. Does anybody have any comments so far? And he and and when we went to um, he personally told my husband. Well, he didn't say he was afraid, but my husband asked him about the five hundred one c three, and he he really kind of he got ghosty. Oh. Yeah, he he like turned white. Anyway, when looking at nationalism or racism. It's just like the Jews in Germany. They lived there, but they weren't really accepted as part of the nation. The, the black people in America were viewed the same way. They weren't really Americans. They were looked at as not really Americans. If you have this racist mentality, na nationalist mindset, you're particularly, particularly afraid of the Chinese, the South American, the Muslim, and the black people. If that's your mindset, what are you afraid of? Anybody know? If this is their mindset, they're afraid of all these different nationalities, why, what are they they're fearful of? 
They're afraid they're that they of would become outnumbered. Yes. People of Insignificant. They're afraid of an extinction. Muslims have a lot of babies. The Chinese population is large and growing, and they never wanted the African Americans here in the first place. As segregation ends, these different ethnic groups of people become more visible in society. Therefore, they are afraid of the extinction of the white European race. This is the mindset, whether the racism is American or any other country in the West, the focus is on this racism issue. However, there are two threats. How can you prevent the white race from being extinct? Because now there are two sub threats around the end of World War II in 1945. Then there comes another movement in 1960s, which was the second wave feminism. Back in 1919, you had the first wave feminism because women wanted the right to vote and own property, and that was permitted. They had already allowed black men to vote, so the voting rights were equal, white men and black men. Why did they allow the women to vote, the white women to vote? Double the white vote. Yes. If you want more white votes, the way to do it is to allow white women to vote as well. In one stroke, you've doubled the white vote, and now three quarters of the population have the right to vote. However, black women were excluded because the purpose of this ruling was really racism. So for the first time, women can vote and own property. However, in the same history of the civil rights movement, women now found a new source of power. And what do you think that was? Can anybody guess? Women having a new source of power. In the workforce. Say that again. Entering the workforce. Yes, that's one too. But there's something that gave them uh, like freedom or just. Reproductive rights. There you go. Birth control. Now women are making the decision that maybe they would like to work and have a career as a serious life choice. They think maybe they would like to have a career rather than a family. So if you're worried about extinction, now how do you feel? And now who is your target? Women. Because if you don't want to go extinct, who do you need? You need women at home having babies. This became woven into the civil rights movement. We talked about the third wave of feminism in 1989 and the fourth wave in 2012. We are particularly focused on the second wave. This was all about women leaving the home and working and deciding not to have children. The second threat was feminism and they in, interpreted this as the biblical breakdown of the family. In the same history, there's another movement fighting for rights in 1969. Does anyone know the name of this event that started this movement? In Stonewall. Stonewall. Yeah, there you go. What happened in Stonewall? It was a raid in New York City on this homosexual bar which had been frequently harassed by the New York City police. It was quite violent. Something happened at this raid where these homosexual people suddenly snapped and they had enough and under one body, they all united and stood up against the police. Before this, they hadn't stood up against the police in any unified way. And this was a shock and it began a movement. They became united and said that they had enough of the discrimination and the persecution. So now there are these three civil rights movements. And again, if you believe that your race is facing extinction, what's the problem with this last group, LGBTQ? What's their problem? 
they can't reproduce. Yeah, they can't reproduce. As you see, there is this very real fear that the white race will go extinct. People don't like gay people for many reasons. There are all kinds of ideas and prejudices. People don't like women for all kinds of reasons. But what I want us to see is that it all leads back to nationalism, in particular, nationalism and racism. And when it starts to impact finances, that's what sparks the moral majority in 1979. This is all one reform line on or one story. And I think we're all familiar with it. It doesn't start because of these court cases or court issues. And then all of a sudden here now the Protestants care about Sunday that's not the story. If this was Millerite history, then over here, you would have slavery. Then you would come to the time of the end. There's issues about slavery and they're arguing about it in the American political system for all of this time. There's a law on it in 1850, which is the big Sunday law on the 144,000 line. And then they fight a war over it. What was the movement here in the Millerite history that grew throughout this time? Does anybody know what that movement was at that time? Abolitionist. Say that again. The abolitionist. Yes, the abolitionist movement. So you've got these warring external movements, the South fighting for slavery using the Bible, and then this rising abolitionist movement fighting for equality. Now bring that to our history. You have this largely Southern Christian fight for discrimination, just like the abolitionist movement. And then you have another external movement fighting for equality. You have two in the Millerite history and two in our history. In the Millerite history, God's people sided with the abolitionists. So you know now who we are required to side with in our history. In the Millerite history, it was slavery all the way through, through from before the time of the end until the cup was full in 2014 till judgment in 2019. In our history, what we see that begins our reform line are these issues in America that become the external fight in the history of the Sunday law. We already expanded on 2014 to 2019 in the previous classes. We wrote about how you have three men in 2014. Who were these men? Can anybody think of these, the names of these men? Uh, Bannon, Miller, and Sessions. Mm -hmm. Jeff Sessions, Steve Bannon, and Stephen Miller. What is Stephen Miller's biggest issue? What is he in control of in the Trump administration? Immigration. Immigration. Immigration and Stephen Miller become very important for us to understand. These three men are going to begin overturning the Republican establishment in 2014. They're going to start cleaning out all of these middle of the road Republicans who are willing to work with Obama. They're going to start focusing them, uh, forcing them out of government and replacing them with these far right Republicans. They began that work in 2014. Who was the first man they took out in 2014? Can anybody remember that? guy that they took out? Eric, Eric Cantor, is that his name? Eric Cantor, yes. Eric Cantor was a reasonable politician. He didn't have strong nationalistic views and he was willing to compromise and work with Obama on the issue of immigration. These three men joined forces to get Eric Cantor removed. They're going to get him out of government and bring in a right 
leaning Republican who will not work with Obama. So Eric Cantor is the first head to fall. In 2014, another man begins to work. He's going to work on one branch of government. Does anybody remember this man's name? His initials are MM. Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell. In 2014, the Republicans took the House. He calls the work that he did the greatest thing he's ever done in politics. What was this thing? What was the greatest thing he could possibly do in politics? Block judicial appointments. Yes. He stopped Obama from appointing judges to the judicial, judicial system. We already spoke about how many judges George Bush appointed and how many judges Obama appointed. And we saw that Trump has appointed as many judges in three years as Obama appointed in eight. The reason he was able to do this was because Mitch McConnell had blocked Obama from filling any vacancies. When Trump became president, there were all these open vacancies and they could fill them with whatever judges he wanted. We also spoke about the balance within the Supreme Court between liberals and conservatives. What is it now? We're speaking back in 2020. Five conservatives and four liberals. If Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies, it will be six conservatives and three liberals. People are already acknowledging even if Trump lost the next election, if Trump lost the next election, it would be decades, if not a generation, before you could undo the damage that he has done. Getting him out of office will not undo this damage. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, along with many others, knows that she has to survive at least until the end of the year in hopes that they get Trump out of the office. Everyone is rooting for her. This work began in 2014. And of course, now we're in 2021, at the end of 2021, and we know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg died on September 18th. So she didn't make it to the end. They have done the work in the judicial system, and now all of these things are coming up in court cases. The problem is, it's an election year, and there are all, there are all these problems with the Democrats. You have the coronavirus, and there are so many things happening right now. We are not aware of the court cases, but we should all research them, in particular the ones that began in 2018 and 2019 and are getting decided this year. There's a danger that as we focus on all these other issues, even just on the words that Trump speaks, we are not seeing the court cases that are happening. At the beginning of his term, when he wanted to get the immigration bills passed, people could stop him. However, the last travel ban went before the Supreme Court and it favored on the side of Trump. The decision was five to four. The five conservatives voted for it and four liberals against it. These actions of Trump are no longer being held back by the Supreme Court. We spoke in our last class about how the Supreme Court has acted as a check on the religious right for at least a hundred years. However, now we find within the last five years, all of that has changed. Back here before our reform line, it's about these four court cases, the interpretation of laws and the interpretation of the constitution. When we come into our reform line and church and state unite in the dispensation of our Sunday law, what we should be focusing on are these court cases. Because here it's about court cases and the ju judicial system. And here it's about court cases and the judicial, judicial system. This has held back the religious right and church and state. But over here, church and state has been restored. They've come back. The history of church and state 
are about the same issues and court cases as in the past. Also about the interpretation of laws and the interpretation of the constitution. There's one important court case that I wanna include. This was a court case in 1989. It also became relevant last year. Back in 1964, you had the Civil Rights Act. It's Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. It included the following clause. It's illegal for any employer to discriminate based on race, religion, or sex. So that means that an employer cannot discriminate against his or her employee because of race, the race that they are, the religion that they are, or their gender. 1989, there was a woman who was very successful in her job. And this firm that she worked for was not friendly to women. The firm was Price Waterhouse. It was Ann Hopkins. She was supposed to be given a promotion, but she was not because she didn't wear makeup. They also said she was too strong, that she needed to be more feminine. She needed to do her hair better and that she needed to change the tone of her voice. These were all of the reasons that they gave her as to why she was not given this important promotion. And it was directly related to her being a woman. So she took them to Supreme Court and she won and Price Waterhouse was forced to give her that promotion. She was able to prove that she was discriminated against because of her gender. This is the court case in 1989, Price Waterhouse versus Hopkins. Why that is an issue now is because the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says that you cannot discriminate based on race, religion, or sex. What is being argued is that when you say gender, what you are talking about is gender stereotypes, that someone must look a certain way to fit into society. In late 2019, there's another case before the Supreme Court. And in this case, it's based on the Civil Rights Act and Price Waterhouse versus Hopkins. And these are three cases that homosexuals have been discriminated against in their workplace. They've taken it to the Supreme Court and they're arguing that they are being discriminated against because of gender stereotypes. The Supreme Court will decide this year whether the Civil Rights Act protects homosexuals or not. This is just one of the cases before the Supreme Court, but there are many others. These cases relate to women and minorities, specifically immigrants and the African-Americans. So there are court cases about race, gender, and about homosexuality. All of these are before the courts. You can see the same related issues. I will give you a news article. It's in the conversation. It's titled, Does the Civil Rights Act Protect LGBT Workers? The Supreme Court is about to decide. This will tell you about this case. And then I would encourage you to go back and look at the 1989 court case. Look it up on Wikipedia. There are three court cases to look up. Bostock versus Clayton County. I'll give you one more, one more article. It's the New York Times. Supreme Court considers whether the Civil Rights Act protects LGBT workers. I believe this article will give more information when the previous articles, uh, than the previous articles because it seems more comprehensive. <clears throat> and then I've selected some of these articles, these articles that, um, because the court case was settled and Supreme Court delivers major victory to LGBT employees. That was a good one. And then Supreme Court docket includes abortion. I, I added a few more articles and then Supreme Court takes, of course, we know the uh, abortion rights are up. And, um, and then also I added a voting rights thing in there. And I've linked all these 
cases, uh, these articles, so you guys can go to them. I'm going to read the one that says, does the civil rights, uh, the Supreme Court delivers major victory to LGBT employees, which answers this question here. In a historic decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled Monday, June 15, 2020, that the 1964 Civil Rights Act protects gay, lesbian, and transgender employees from discrimination based on sex. The ruling was six to three with Justice Neil Gorsuch, President Trump's first appointee to the court, writing the majority opinion. The opinion was joined by Chief Justice John Roberts and the court's four liberal justices. Today, Gorsuch said, we must decide whether an employer, an employee can fire, wait, whether an employer can fire someone simply for being homosexual or transgender. The answer is clear. He found such discrimination is barred by the language in the 1964 law that bans discrimination in employment based on race, religion, na national origin, or sex. The decision is a huge victory for the LGBT community community and a major loss for the Trump administration, which had sided with employers in three cases before the court. Monday's ruling was remarkable in many aspects. Nearly half of the states have no legal protection against LGBT employees. Now, now the federal law will protect employees in those states from firing and other adverse employment decisions made on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. So that was a very, very good one. Prior to the time of the end, there are three movements and the uniting of the religious right. Steve Bannon will tell you that everything went wrong in this history. In particular, the latter years of George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr., and then everyone panicked under Obama. He was their worst nightmare for the Christian nationalists, and they unite against, united again, but this time they, began, they had a plan. Whatever your view is in 2014 as a Sunday law, this is where it all began. The takedown of the judicial system and the American government, which consists of the judicial system, the legislative system, and the presidency. They won the presidency in 2016, but they began taking down the American government way before Trump ever decided to run. So that is as it stands today. And this dispensation from 2014 to 2019 has tested all three groups because the anthonyms can see these court cases. They can see Donald Trump and all what is happening as well as we can. Of course, we know that they are lacking the prophetic message. I'm not saying that they have all they need, but this has been a plowing, their preparation based on all this work. So it is what began our reform lines and these same court cases in the, this, this dispensation began the reform line of the world. This is the reform line of the Nethanims or the world. And you can see the same issue. When you come to their history of harvest, you come down to the Sunday law history. You know, it's not going to be these issues. And when you come down to Sabbath Sunday issue, that is not what the Protestants have been fighting about either. That is not the change that they have to see in society. In particular, right, hold on, sorry. I've said all I wanted to on these subjects and the next step is to start drawing out the history of Christ. However, I'm going to close now, but I just want us to keep these things in our mind as we discuss the history of Christ, even as we look at this history, when we do line upon line and see what Christ is trying to teach us or teach his disciples overlaid with our latter rain, we can begin to understand what he's trying to teach us. 
What do we mean when we say that Elder Jeff had the wrong understanding of the knowledge of the kingdom or geography of the kingdom? When we do the line of Christ, we can keep this in our minds. The issues that Christ, the issues that Christ was fighting for and the unlearning of the disciples is not the same thing that we need to unlearn. We are not expecting that Adventists are going to start a state and become a political power and find this secret nation island somewhere and set up an Adventist empire. The Jews were expecting the return of their empire, but we are not expecting an Adventist empire. The real question is, what is it that we have wrong? If you kneel with me, we will, we will close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for our blessings. We see how you have guided us, but also how you're guiding others. You don't wish anyone to be lost. Those who cannot be immediately reached by us because we're not ready and they are afraid, you're already preparing them. The same time that you are training us. Lord, we do not wish to get to heaven and to see that there are people lost because we didn't do our work properly. I pray that you will help us as we endeavor to understand what it is about your character that we don't understand and unlearn our mistakes. I pray that you will help us in this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And that is the end. Thank you. You're welcome. We see a lot revolving in the importance of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I've learned more than I ever did in school. It really wasn't didn't pay attention much in school. I felt like whatever they wanted to teach was just, a lot of it seemed useless. <laughs> and uh, just, I don't know, I just wasn't interested. I skated through, but, um, but never really paid that much attention. So we definitely learned more history. I have anyways than I ever learned before. Yes. And, you know, we're at a time, you know, that, there's all these court cases. I mean, it just all these issues. Um, thank God for the, you know, the LGBT. But then now we're dealing with abortion rights. And, and it's just, uh, and then the voting rights. I mean, they, they're, they're working very diligently to change the voting rights in many of the states. I mean, this pandemic has really given these conservatives uh, an, an edge. It has because while everybody was preoccupied with the pandemics, they were in there, um, you know, Change. changing laws and, 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 and setting it up so that, you know, rights would be taken away from people. Mm. So. Does anybody have any comments? Anything about any of this? It's like all of this is, is suffering, everything. A, a woman's right, uh, reproduction, everything. It's, it's this whole thing. LGBT, um, and, and we don't even know how long their rights are gonna be, you know? It's just uh, disturbing, <laughs> very disturbing. <laughs> 